I have the feeling I'm done with discipline and uh, also with uh, in spirit spiritual in the spiritual way with sadness um, yeah sometimes I I have moments when I sit every day two months three months four months six months and then I discard it and I say no more I can't it's it's finished uh, but I go back to it again and yeah I I I think I did already that much and on the other hand I there is uh, still this um, hmm. Wie heißt das? Zwang? Um, den, hm? Urge. 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 Yeah. To, to grab something and continue um, meditations, sadhanas. Mm -hmm. What's the dilemma? May I ask? <laughs> <laughs> mm. well, I wonder if there is an end to it. <laughs> end to what? <laughs> uh, to sadhanas, to meditation, to the whole journey of seeking and seeking and seeking. There's no, 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 there's no end to it because you know, there's, there's, there's no. The simple answer is that there's no end to it, because... <laughs> <laughs> Why there's no end, no end to it, mm -hmm. and you know why there's no end 
to seeking. <laughs> because in order to find something, you need to lose it in the first place. <laughs> find the <this> keepers <laughs> that's why you know that expression find the keepers thank you <laughs> so the reason why there's no end to seeking because uh, in order to find it it had to be lost in the first place. <laughs> so, you, you, okay. <clears throat> okay. Maybe seeking language, maybe it's in the la maybe language somehow got the better better of us, right? When all this, you know, seeking. And I don't want to hold on to it, but it's just, it's just so filled with that, you know, with all these possibilities that irresistible. You know. the, <coughs> therefore, the Sanskrit term sadhaka actually translates not as a seeker. Sadhaka is a finder. Sadaka is the one who finds, finds truth. Um, but let's not get lost in the etymology of the, of the term. What you... What you felt like sharing is that, and you said you've been through so much, right? Through, through so much, right? I have a maybe more humble perspective on this. <clears throat> it depends what you call more meditation, right? More sadhana. Uh, again, not to get sort of particular or get lost in definition of terms. Good, very good. It will eventually will be expressed, and then there will be less and less propensity. You see. So maybe your sadhana also need to be changed radically, dramatically. For example, I don't think that Rafael Nadal can ever stop playing tennis, even though he has the biggest yacht of all the sportsmen. He's the most decorated tennis player in the world. You know who I'm talking about? Rafael Nadal, yeah? He's, by, the, by the way, he's Mallorquin, he lives in Mallorca. In Manac he's from Manacor. He, it's not like he will, let's say, no longer compete at championships, so he doesn't need to practice. But do you think he's going to stop playing tennis? So when the practice of playing tennis becomes enjoyment of playing, te playing tennis, I'm just making suggestions. No, 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 I want to show off. Please don't, don't cut me out, you know, like, it's my chance, it's my retreat, I want to show off. <laughs> <coughs> I still have a few minutes. And I said that before, so it's a kind of also sign of 
been around. In London, I lived on Randall, Randolph Avenue for a period of time. And in fact, I left it in the early 90s. No, I moved in in the early 90s, left late 90s, and came back to the same street, two doors next to it, many, many years after, I believe around 2004. And this is also at the time when I've met my wife, Amrita Madevi, in 2006. But when I first moved in, there was this, there is this triangular garden, so-called, it's internal garden that is made out of the junk, you know, the, the residential area, right? This Randolph Avenue, Clifton Road, and Clifton Crescent. And I could hear someone playing cello exceptionally well, you know? I'm just like, okay, I'm busy, I'm young guys. So I'm talking about early 90s. Still, I'm in my late 20s, right? going into my 30, 30s. And I can hear, you know, each time I go outside and you have the keys, right? You go, it's like, a, it's a shared communal garden, it's called. And it has a nickname, Triangular Garden. It's like someone playing cello. And then my neighbor tells me, whom I befriended. Oh, he's Russian, by the way. I said, no kidding. Yeah, his name is Mstislav Rostropovich. I'm like, what? Mstislav Rostropovich is a, was a living legend. It's the cello player for whom at least three world-class composers composed while thinking for him in particular to perform their music. And we're speaking about Shostakovich, Schmidtke, and Elgar. Russian, German, Brit. Oh, sorry, Britain. Britain, not Elgar. I beg your pardon. These composers composed for him to play. And I hear him for like, I think for a couple of years, you know, every morning playing there, playing, you know, cello. And the cello is also happened to be one of my most favorite of all string instruments. They say that cello has the sound most resonant with the body. It's almost like the trunkness of the body and trunkness of the cello. It has the same resonance, same timber-like sound. Whereas violin is more penetrating, higher in octave in terms of its impact on the body. Cello is being felt also here as well. You know? That warmth of the sound. So what I'm trying to say to you is that at that time, Mstislav Rostropovich was already, was already, after his career as a, a conductor at some of the greatest orchestras in the world, came back to Russia, received decorations, the highest decorations in Russia and honors that were possibly given to any living pe person. He was given this beautiful apartment in the old part of St. Petersburg. And he would live between two cities primarily. He will move and London place, this apartment, was his main residence where he lived with his wife, Galina Vishnevska. He already worked as a conductor. He no longer played on stage, full stop. Would you call it a sadhana? Why was he practicing every morning? We became very good friends. I'm really, really, really honored and proud at the very same time that I was fortunate enough to meet this composer. This is why I ask you, can you have a few more minutes to show off? Because it brings us these very sweet memories. And when we were introduced 
you know and of course when we you know when we were introduced i was largely unknown painter and you know and he is a world class musician and conductor right with a busy schedule of course there's this slight kind of like you know how you you know and of, co of course, I had his CDs and stuff. I knew who Mstislav Rostropovich was. But when I've met him, he immediately said, Slava. And I said, Igor. And, no, not Igor, Igor. In Russian pronunciation, Igor. Uh, Igorek. So it's like kind of a you know, very, very informal diminutive in Russian, <laughs> how you would call uh, your son, your child, you know, or... It's a very sweet way. And never he called me anything other than that. And he refused me not calling him anything other than Slava. And every time he will be in town, there will be an invitation, wherever, whatever he's doing, in my door, written, you know, Igoryok, I'm going to conduct at Royal Albert Hall. Here is a couple of tickets for you. I'll see you backstage later, you know. But what am I sharing here is that this sound, every time you come in the guard, like, you know, you hear this sound, you know, this cello, you know, whatever that is, Bach, doesn't matter, Elgar. Was he practicing for what? So there's something else in the question, you see? Something else in the question is not, it's, it's about when is the fruits of that? When is this begins to bear the fruit rather than how long will I'm going to practice? When will this become a play? When will this become a joy? Why don't we truly address things for the, their names? I want to experience joy, bliss. This is the truth. Please look to me in the eyes if you don't mind. If you don't mind. You know, I just want to meet your eyes. It's not really about how much more do and what do I practice. Isn't it? It's more about something else. Because when it gives joy, it's no longer, we don't know the difference the line is obliterated. I still, every time I go for my breakfast, and this is the, the sacredness of the times, you know, I have something for me to read. I take something, something I take, and I never read it because I never have the time. But I always, I love, love, Nothing more than revisiting certain passages. These are not novels, essays. I don't have that luxury to read that entertainment kind of literature. And for a very long time, I prefer TV time. I confess, I prefer to watch adaptations. You see? Not reading. But I love greatly well put together expositions, you know, and I have some, I end up not reading it, but I carry it and I put it there because of the years of that habit, always. And there is a, also term, Guru Sadhana, this very famous teacher not long ago said, said there's, there's no practice for, you know, if we truly realize being, doesn't have anything to practice. That is true. But to say that there is no sadhana after the end of sadhana, that is not true. There are many different levels of sadhana, many different degrees of sadhana. A great philosopher of India of the 20th century and of the 19th, 20th century, Shurya Rabindu Ghosh, who was considered to be philosopher, sage. Have you heard of that name? 
Yes. His final sadhana was the Savitri. His literally monument. Which took him a rough estimate from what mother, his life work partner, said 20 years to ride. Why would he do that? He realized himself very early on in life. And he became a world-renowned teacher. And yet he takes this up on himself. And you know there is this tradition that when sages reach certain maturity, then they are ready to be of service of the goddess of wisdom. And then the sadhana of a very different kind unfolds from there. They beg the goddess of speech to express herself through them as the greatest blessing. They become these instruments, these vehicles. And it's a sadhana, it's a commitment. It's not done, ah, I'm a poet and I want everyone to know it. It's not done from any proof, anything. It's done actually to maybe measuring a different depth of that hollowness so this pure song of the Devi can stream through. That's what the Savitri is. Echoing in what came before. There are some modern scholars, don't want to begin to mention names, who dismiss that Adi Shankara poss possibly could have written Sundarya Lahari. They have the audacity to dismiss it because they're so, so all-knowing. It's the same colonial imperialistic attitude towards any, everything that is in India because India is such a rich and such a generous culture. Come and take. Yeah, just like the other week, two weeks ago, I had this teacher speaking, this scholar, announcing this, you know, in response to a question, boom. No, it's all nonsense, you know, there's no confirmation. The whole culture is based on that. That Sundarya Lahari is the work of Adi Shankara as the hymn to Shakti. It's his tribute. It's his sadhana. So you see, there is a beautiful phase ahead of you now. Can you see it now? This is why I want to drown in your eyes. And you, please, drown in mine. This is a creative time. You All this was practice. All this what you've done before, so that you can now, now enter the next level, a beautiful level of true self-expression. It's called creativity. Why do you think the screams are? Tell me, please. Why are these screams? Will you allow me to tell you? Will you allow me? It's because you do not express yourself. You do not express yourself. You're bottling it all in. You're keeping it all in. And it doesn't want to stay in. So it does in this way. You see? So make this realignment now. Right now. <clears throat> I'm also trying to learn to be less bossy. See? Each time I go back to my room, I'm, how did I do? You know, like, somebody, how did I do? But I can't ask her because everything I do is perfect for her. <laughs> so it's like a completely wrong thing, wrong person to ask. You know? I deliberately do something nasty and ask her, and it's perfect still. So, like, okay. <clears throat> now, I evaluate what I could have done better. How could have this been done in more considered, more compassionate, more direct, more connecting way? This is important to me. So therefore, I don't want to boss you around, but 
there's a strong propensity to kind of go after you. You know? That this is, this is, you know? Because you have so much beauty there. There's so much beauty. Even when you were asking these questions, no, I remember you so well. All throughout the whole course. Arguing with Alan, you know? He tells you, trim your questions down. Make it more concise. No. He needs to read it all. <laughs> so, this is important. You see? So, you ask me now, you get it. There's no end to seeking, because you never lost anything. So you cannot find that what was not lost. So you ask me, what is it then about? It's about expressing yourself. It's about expressing yourself. And see what happens. Okay? How, what? It, it's secondary. But this is your now... Literally, it's your personal song, your Savitri. It is your duty to yourself. You have to face it. And then, and only then, you can know how long would it take and what it takes. And maybe then the question will no longer be relevant. Maybe it will no longer be important. Because you will no longer need to find anything, because you will actually be happy losing yourself in what you do. Therefore, finding would no longer be crucial. Something else is here at play. There is a lot of pressure inside because of many years of discipline and seeking and the things are getting stronger instead of... Mm -hmm. Yes, there is also an attachment and habit. There is a habit also. It, create, it also turns into a pattern. See, it turns into a certain pattern. So, <clears throat> also to simplify it, the, there's nothing wrong in wanting to know more. This is no, it's normal. To, there's no, there's, you know, like it's. There are many examples that can be given also. More relatable than this, let's say, what may feel like colossal figures historically, but even I know of people who have been able to find and change whilst they are at something which they were already good at because they didn't want to feel settled on something. But this is of secondary importance because I, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing wrong in wanting to know more, you see? But of course, there's a lot in the marketplace, there's a lot out there and we go and move like that bee from flower to flower until we find where we can really drown in that pollen. So we completely get saturated in that. But as something else that what you have spoken in relation to everything else that, that wants to be reflected back is that, that that what's important. It is your duty to find that joy just as we spoke last night that to distinguish between the looking for <clears throat> enjoyment in what you do and you know the distinction between the source of joy. But here, finding joy, but you can only find that in allowing that process of self-expression. So then, 
you will no longer feel like a seeker. You see? 